Section 19 of Recollections of a Busy Life by William B. Forwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Recreations. It is a good thing to have a hobby. Perhaps in these days we have too many and pursue them with too much intensity to the neglect of more important matters. To this I must, to some extent, plead guilty. I have devoted much time and thought to boating and to gardening. My boating days commenced in the sixties, when I frequently sailed with my uncle, Alfred Bower, who owned some of the crack yachts belonging to the Birkenhead Model Yacht Club, the Presto, Challenge, Enigma, etc. They were large beamy boats, of about eight to ten tons, with center boards. Our racing was mostly in the upper reaches of the Mersey, lying between Eastham and the Aigberth shore. In 1866 I made my first venture, buying the American centerboard yacht Truant, which had greatly distinguished herself for speed, and taking her up to Windermere. She was not, however, of much use on that expansive but treacherous sheet of water. The heavy squalls were too much for her huge sail plan. I also owned and sailed on the Mersey the Glance, eight tons, Satanella, fifteen tons, Saraband, fourteen tons, and Leander, twenty tons. I then, for a time, gave up yachting on the Mersey, and in 1868 bought a racing yacht on Lake Windermere, the Spray. She was most successful, winning in 1870 every race we sailed. In 1871 I was induced to build a twenty-ton racing cutter for the sea, and called her the Playmate. She was built by Ratsey, at Coe's, and was the first boat to carry all her lead ballast on her keel, and in consequence her advent was watched with considerable interest. I sailed her for two years in the various regattas round the coast, on the Solent and on the Clyde, but she was only fairly successful. The competition in the class was very keen, and the boats built by Dan Hatcher carried away most of the prizes. This was the time when yachting, I think, reached its highest point of interest, and the matches of the forty, twenty, and ten-ton classes were watched with great keenness throughout the country. In the forty-ton class we had the Norman, Muriel, Bloodhound, Glance, etc., and in the twenty-ton class the Vanessa, Quickstep, Sunshine, etc. We also had some very fine sixty-tonners, and an excellent class in schooners. Our regattas were conducted with much keenness, and created great enthusiasm. Locally we had many active yachting men, Mr. David McIver, M.P., who sailed the Sunshine, the Shadow, and the Gleam, Mr. Gibson Sinclair, Mr. Astley Gardner, Mr. Coddington, Mr. Andrew Anderson, Mr. St. Clair Byrne, and others. It is always wise, and I am sure in the long run pays best, to do everything thoroughly, even although it is only for sport or pastime. And when the Board of Trade allowed yacht owners to present themselves for examination and obtain their certificates as master mariners, I entered my name, and was the fourth yacht owner to qualify, Lord Brassey being the first. My sea experience was, of course, of great service to me. I afterwards found my Board of Trade certificate as a master mariner gave me increased pleasure in yachting, and my crew great confidence in my skill as a navigator. Selling the playmate, I returned to Windermere. Indeed, I had never left it, but I sailed the regattas each year, and in the year 1908 I completed my forty consecutive years racing upon the lake winning for the second year in succession the Champion Cup. The competition for this cup is limited to yachts which have won first or second prizes. My yacht, the Kelpie, was designed by Mr. A. Milne of Glasgow. She is quite one of the smartest boats on the lake, particularly in light weather. 
During my forty years sailing upon the lake, I have witnessed great changes in the designs of the competing yachts. The boats, starting with a length of twenty feet on the water line, were gradually enlarged by being designed to immerse the whole of the counter, making the water line twenty-six feet six inches. We carried about seven hundred and fifty feet area of sails, including in this a huge foresail. The boats were large and powerful, but difficult to manage, and it is a wonder no accident took place. We afterwards introduced a load line length of twenty-two feet with overhangs, with the result that we have established a very smart and useful class of boat. I built many yachts on the lake, the Althea, Truant, Charm, Brenda, Playmate, Breeze, Pastime, and Kelpie, and several boats for the smaller class. I also built, in 1881, the steel launch Banshee. She was designed by Alexander Richardson, and is today the prettiest launch on the lake. I have raced on Windermere with varying success, but it has been the source of enormous enjoyment, and the days spent on Windermere are among my happiest. When we first visited Bonus we were content to reside in lodgings, but in 1879 we rented Falborough, a charming little house on the lake shore below the ferry. After remaining here three or four years, we occupied for longer or shorter periods Windless Beck, Lorig Brow, Ambleside, High Ray Bank, and in 1889 I took on a long lease Wickfield at the head of Pullwick Bay, a charming house with lovely gardens and furnished also with a boathouse and pier. Here we remained until 1902, and since that time we have occasionally occupied Ray Cottage, a pretty dwelling nestling under the shadow of Ray Castle. It would indeed be very difficult to describe the enjoyment Windermere has afforded us during all these years. Our long walks, mountain climbs, picnics on the lakes, fishing, and last but not least, our regattas, filled our days with pleasure, and we look back upon our holidays with sunny memories of great happiness. In 1904 I wrote a history of the Royal Windermere Yacht Club. The Reverend Canon Ronsley added an interesting chapter, descriptive of the lake, and the book was illustrated by some excellent photographs. As a thank-offering to God for permitting us to enjoy such great happiness, in 1908 we placed a stained-glass window in the parish church at Bonus, representing the Te Deum. In 1880 we built at Limington a fifty-ton yawl, which was named the Leander. In this we cruised for three summers off the west coast of Scotland and south coast of England, but I found I could not spare the necessary time and was obliged to give up sea-yachting for good in 1885. I was elected rear commodore of the Royal Mersey Yacht Club in 1879, and was for a time also commodore of the Cheshire Yacht Club. Yacht Racing Association In my early days of sea-racing, being much impressed by the want of a central authority to regulate all matters connected with yacht racing, I brought the question under the notice of Mr. Dixon Kemp, the yachting editor of the field. He consulted Colonel Leach, a very leading and influential yachtsman, with the result that we formed the Yacht Racing Association. We secured the Prince of Wales as our president, and the Marquis of Exeter as our chairman, and very speedily recruited a large number of members. I was elected a member of the council and subsequently chairman of the measurement committee, which had very important work to do in connection with the rating of yachts for racing purposes. The old Thames rule was played out. Yachts had become of such excessive length and depth that a new rule of measurement became necessary. We took a large amount of expert evidence and finally drafted a rule which was adopted and remained in force until the present international rule superseded it. Royal Canoe Club This club was founded in the sixties 
by Rob Roy MacGregor, who had built a small decked canoe in which he had navigated the principal rivers in Europe and the Holy Land. MacGregor was not only an enthusiastic boating man, but he was a good Christian worker and philanthropist, well known in the East End of London. Rob Roy appealed to me and others to form a northern branch of the canoe club on the Mersey. We did so in 1868, establishing our headquarters at Tranmere. The club was very flourishing, and the upper reaches of the Mersey formed a very attractive cruising ground. But the increase in the number of steamers destroyed canoeing on the Mersey as it has destroyed yachting. Living as we did at Seaforth, I was able to run my canoe down to the shore and enjoy many pleasant sails in the Crosby Channel. Finding an ordinary Rob Roy was too small and very wet in a seaway, I designed and built a sailing canoe with a center board, which was a great success and was the pioneer of sailing canoes. Gardening There can be no more delightful pastime than gardening. I may claim this to be my pet hobby. Other pastimes are evanescent and leave behind them no lasting results or afford no more than a passing pleasure. But in gardening we have seed time and harvest, all the pleasures of sowing and planting, watching the gradual growth, training and nurturing the young plant, and in due time gathering in the flowers or fruit. And in these days, when so much is done in hybridizing, we have the added charm of experimenting in raising new varieties. We began to import orchids in 1866, bringing them from the West Indies and Central America in large wooden boxes, thinking it necessary to keep them growing, but we lost more than half on the voyage. They are now roughly packed in baskets or bales, and a very large percentage arrive safely. When in India in 1907, at Darjeeling, I hired two men and two donkeys to go down into the valleys of Bhutan to collect orchids. They returned in about ten days with four large baskets full, chiefly denrobiums. Among them there was a good deal of rubbish, but also many good plants which I sent home and which have since flowered and done well. There are no plants more difficult to kill than orchids, but on the other hand there are no plants more difficult to grow and to flower. Their habits must be known and studied, and above all they must be provided with the exact temperature and degree of moisture they have been accustomed to. But the reward of successful cultivation is great, and worth striving for. No flowers can be more lovely in form and in color, and they have the great merit of lasting for days and even weeks in all the wealth of luxuriant beauty. They are the aristocracy of flowers. End of section 19《of Recollections of a Busy Life》by William B. Forwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Obiter Dicta Life, viewed in retrospect down the vista of half a century of activity, presents many lessons which may be both interesting and instructive, lessons from one's own experience. Lessons derived from watching the careers of others, of those who have made a brilliant success, of others who have made a disastrous failure, and of the many who have lived all their lives on the ragged edge of between plenty and penury. It is also instructive to notice the conditions under which the great problem of life had to be worked out, as they vary to some extent with each decade. The world does not stand still. It will not mark time for our convenience. We have to go with the times, and the enigma of life is how to turn them to the best account. 
The outstanding features of the present day are the keenness of competition in every walk of life, and the rapidity with which events occur, creating a hurry which is prejudicial to the careful ordering of one's own life. Competition has always been very keen, and the cry has ever been for the return of those good old days when competition was less. If they ever existed, it was before my time. Everything, however, is comparative. With larger numbers of people there must be more competition, but there are also more opportunities, more employment, more people to feed, and more to clothe. But with the advance of education, particularly of technical knowledge, the competition has become more intense in the higher branches of industrial and intellectual activity. Still, there is room, and ample room, on the top. The lower rungs of the ladder are well occupied, but the numbers thin off as we approach the top, and this must be more and more the case as education advances. The hurry of the present day is prejudicial to that thoroughness which is necessary if we are to attain efficiency. The hurry of everyday life becomes more and more conspicuous. Living at high pressure, in this superheated atmosphere, we are apt to lose our sense of proportion, and crowd our minds with thoughts, schemes, and projects, regardless of our power of assimilation and arrangement. Our minds are apt to become mere lumber rooms into which everything is tossed. Many things are forgotten and cannot be found when wanted. How much better it would be for ourselves and for the world at large if we could live with more deliberation, if we could specialize more, be more intense within a more limited range of thought and activity, less casual more thorough in the commonplaces of life. Life would not lose in interest or picturesqueness, and it would gain in symmetry and value. It may be said that while it might add to the effectiveness of life, it would deprive it of much of its color and romance. This would not, however, necessarily follow. On the contrary, greater effectiveness would open out new avenues for thought and action, new spheres of usefulness, more refined and elevating in their character, and more satisfying in their results. These appear to be surroundings in which we have to work out the problems of our lives, and this leads us to the consideration of how we are to achieve success under these conditions of competition and hurry. SUCCESS IN LIFE there are various kinds of success in life, business success, social success, and success in public affairs. Perhaps to the ordinary individual, business success is the most important. It is a source of happiness, promotes social success, and opens up avenues of public usefulness. If we look back and endeavor to trace the careers of those with whom we have been associated when young, I think we shall observe that those who have been most successful in their business careers have, with few exceptions, not been the brilliant and clever boys, but rather those of duller intellect, who have had the gift of steady application. This faculty is not born in us. We are by nature casual and apt to follow the lines of thought and endeavor which require the least labor, and offer the most varied interest. We hate the grind of sustained effort. It bores us, and we long for something new. This dislike of prolonged application and desire for change has made more shipwrecks of business careers than perhaps any other cause. In its craving for change and excitement, it leads to speculation as a possible road to wealth without effort. The power of steady application must be inculcated in the school by insisting that every subject taught shall be mastered by the boy, 
and not left until he has made it his own, and is able to clasp his hands on the far side of it. A few subjects taught and mastered in this way are of more value than a whole curriculum of studies learnt in a superficial and casual manner. We are apt to forget that the primary object of all education must be to train the mental faculties and to educate the judgment. We are too prone to cram the boy with knowledge which he has not the power to assimilate and make his own. We set out too often with the presumption that as a boy is born with legs and arms which are ready for use, so he must be born with a brain ready cultivated. The arms and legs do their work very much better if they are trained and strengthened by gymnastic exercises. In like manner, the brain requires training. For this reason I have always regretted the gradual elimination of Greek and Latin from our national system of education. I know of nothing to take their place as a gymnastic for the mind. We too often send boys into the world to handle the most mighty weapons for weal or for woe, capital and credit, without any proper mental equipment. The lack of hard mental training is more far-reaching and disastrous than is generally supposed. The want of accuracy leads to many mistakes. Mistakes lead to excuses, and excuses mark the high road to lies. The absence of accuracy is the fruitful parent of carelessness in thought, in habit, and in the discharge of the duties of everyday life. I fear this is a national weakness, for I have found that the German clerk excels in accuracy. He may be wanting in initiative, but he is accurate and reliable in his work. Englishmen have, however, remarkable gifts for a business career if they are properly trained and educated. A good English man of business is the best in the world. He has great initiative, the power of getting through work, the talent to observe and to form a rapid judgment. But he is not born with these accomplishments. They are largely the result of education and training. There is a great reluctance in this country to introduce any system of compulsory military service. Without dwelling upon its advantages to the nation, as likely to increase the physique of our men, military discipline would have a very beneficial moral effect. Probably one of the most valuable traits of character is that of obedience, and this would be cultivated and enforced by military drill and I think it would also add to our self-respect. As things are moving, we are in danger of becoming a nation of slackers, both physically and mentally. I have already spoken of the necessity for steady perseverance and accuracy if we are to make a success in life, but there are two other qualities which are also essential to success, the capacity to observe and the gift of imagination. OBSERVATION The number of men who go through life with their eyes closed is astonishing. These men regret their want of luck. They say they have had no chances. Alas, they have had their chances, but either failed to see them, or lacked the courage or capacity to take advantage of them. The world is so constituted that changes are ever taking place and every change is fruitful of opportunities. We hear it said of some that everything they touch turns into gold. It is only another way of saying that they are ever on the lookout for opportunities, and are not laggards in turning them into good account. IMAGINATION The want of imagination prevents many men from making use of their opportunities. On a dull day, when the clouds hang in the valleys, and obscure from view the tops of the mountains, imagination fills up the picture, and probably paints the crests of the mountains much higher than they really are. Too many men travel only in the valleys of life, 
content with what they see, and imagine nothing above or beyond. Suppose, for instance, a serious disaster overtakes the harvest. The man endowed with imagination will look beyond the disaster and note its far-reaching effects, and in them recognize his opportunities for action. General Sir Richard Baden-Powell is doing an excellent work with his Boy Scouts, not only in teaching discipline, but in encouraging the habits of observation and imagination, which will be of the greatest value to them in after life. I have touched upon three points necessary to success in life. Thoroughness and accuracy, the faculty of observation, and the gift of imagination, because they are but seldom prominently referred to. It is not needful to enlarge upon the value of character, nor upon the necessity for integrity. Of nothing am I more certain than that honesty is the best policy. I can think of no career which has been permanently successful in which this golden rule has not been observed. Speculation is the gambler's road to fortune. It has many ups and downs, and generally leads to disaster and the slough of despond. But there is a wide gulf separating speculation from the enterprise of the genius that foresees and devises new methods of trade, or anticipates, as the result of careful observation and calculation, changes in the market value of securities and commodities. Enterprise degenerates into speculation when the dictates of caution and prudence are set aside. To use the words of an old and much respected Liverpool merchant, who recently passed away, quote, commercial success requires the concurrence of two contrary tendencies, caution and enterprise. Caution is necessary in avoiding risks, in foreseeing consequences, and in providing against contingencies, even remote ones. But this will not carry a man far. He must also have the brain to originate, and the courage to strike when a favorable opportunity occurs. What we call a sound judgment is the due balance and just proportion of a well-stored mind. In no department of life is there more need for this balance and proportion than in the higher walks of commerce. The head of a great firm needs to be a statesman, an economist, and a financier, as well as a merchant. Unquote. I had proposed to conclude this sketch by a short account of the men of my time still living, who have been active in the making of Liverpool, but so many have lent a helping hand the work having been that of the many rather than the few, that it would be impossible to avoid being invidious. Events move so rapidly, the men and circumstances of today are crowded out and their memory obliterated in the new interests of tomorrow, that no man's work or influence can be said to have exercised more than an evanescent power. Yet Liverpool has been built up, its commerce, its municipality, and its charitable and philanthropic work by leaders of men who have found their work lying at their hand and have done it, and have done it well. My story must now end. It has necessarily been told in a somewhat desultory manner, leaving out many details and many incidents which might have added to its completeness. But if it interests any of my kin or my friends, and still more, if it inspires them to make some effort on behalf of our great and glorious city, to elevate its social and intellectual life, to adorn and beautify its public streets and places, to brighten the lives and homes of the people, to carry forward and onward the great temple we are building to the glory of God, it will not have failed in its purpose. End of Recollections of a Busy Life by William B. Forwood Recording by David Martin